Hi, my name is Stephen Keynes, and I am the current residential fellow at the Codex Center for Legal Informatics, a joint program between Stanford Law School and the School of Computer Science. I am also a recent graduate of the University of Miami School of Law with a concentration in the business of innovation, law, and technology. While current circumstances prevent us from convening Future Law 2020 in person, I'm very excited with the chance to share my work with you digitally. My research focuses on facial recognition use by the government and law enforcement in the United States. While this is a very complex topic, this video is meant to only give you a cursory overview of some of the legal, ethical, and regulatory considerations of this technology. In this video, I will discuss how facial recognition technology works, where it is currently being deployed, legal and ethical considerations surrounding the technology, and actions that all interested parties can take. For more information, go to the link in the description of this video and also some other resources that I'll provide at the end. Let's get started. Facial recognition systems are a type of biometric identification system, meaning that they observe some type of physiological or behavioral characteristic. Other examples include a fingerprint reader or some type of gate detection software which will detect the way that you walk. These, all of these systems differ from traditional key and lock or password based systems because they observe biological features. Facial recognition systems are also a type of computer vision algorithm, and they typically are convolutional neural networks. Most facial recognition systems can be broken down into four steps. In the first, face detection, the algorithm searches the image to determine is there a face in the image. If there is a face, what's known as a bounded box will be placed over it. In step two, that bounded box is aligned to a predetermined orientation so that it can be later compared to other faces. Step three, feature extraction, transfers several facial features into quantitative measurements. So features like the distance between your pupils, the distance between your cheekbones, and the length of your jawline are all transferred into quantitative measurements. In step four, comparison and recognition, the algorithm compares previously extracted features from previous photos in the database against the search query photo. And if there is a match, the facial recognition system will identify it. And it's also key to know that there are a variety of parameters that they can use to determine whether the face itself is a match. It's not as simple as just a 90% match. There are thresholds and different settings that you can also choose from the search query side to guarantee that the match that you have fits the set of confidence that you seek to require. Full-scale systems as we see them deployed in modern cities require three things. The first is a well-trained algorithm that has been sufficiently tested. Secondly, you need data sets to not only train the algorithm, but then also data sets to query photos amongst. And three, you need the physical infrastructure of cameras in place if the goal is real-time surveillance. And when we refer to the quality of infrastructure, we're referring to the camera resolution, the placement, the angling, does it also work during the nighttime? In terms of deployment, a wide scale of use cases exist. On the personal side, individuals can use facial recognition to unlock their phones or provide access to a home safe. In the public sector, stadiums and stores can often use facial recognition to either detect persons of interest or identify shoplifters. The government uses facial recognition now in certain criminal investigations and as well as places like points of entry, such as airports for no-fly lists and potential terrorists. And then also internationally, we're seeing it even being deployed in cities such as Moscow to, make, to ensure that quarantine individuals during the COVID-19 crisis remain in their homes and also in China, where it's being used to monitor the ethnic minority of the Uyghurs in what many believe to be human rights violations. While a number of potential harms and considerations arise when facial recognition technology is being used, I believe that the majority of these claims can be summed up on what I refer to as a spectrum of harms, in which there are three different groups. Misidentifications, because this technology is not perfect and has varied accuracy amongst different demographics, such as gender, race, and ethnicity. Organizations such as the ACLU have shown that facial recognition technology can misidentify many people, including even congresspeople and athletes. Due process concerns are also a major issue where facial recognition is currently being used in criminal investigations and prosecutions with very little knowledge being provided to those specific criminal defendants. And as the case of Willie Lynch v. Florida has shown us, Oftentimes, analysts or field agencies in the technology do not have sufficient training in the technology to also be able to operate it in a comprehensive manner. The final issue is the increase of the surveillance state, which is best personified in the issue of mission creep, which says that technology may be deployed for one reason, but may later be expanded to a variety of other applications. We saw this with license plate readers, which were originally used for 
finding missing children, and also finding lost or stolen vehicles. And this was later expanded by ICE to find undocumented immigrants. Similarly here with facial recognition, once a city adopts a network of the physical infrastructure of cameras, then they start activating facial recognition features that can be applied for a wide variety of different situations. For more information on why the surveillance state, the increase of the surveillance state specifically, can be an issue, check out my other work, such as my podcast, which I'll discuss later on. In regards to legislation, certain cities have banned the technology used for by government officials outright, such as San Francisco, Oakland, and Berkeley. Certain states have enacted legislation that regulates the flow of biometric information, whether it be from their DMV databases or other sources. And other pieces of legislation have also additionally prevented the integration of facial recognition technology with cameras such as body cameras. On the private side, st states like Illinois have enacted pieces of legislation such as the Biometric Information Privacy Act, which regulates the use of facial recognition te technology by private actors and requires certain conditions such as like informed consent and has already resulted in certain lawsuits alike against the Facebook, which resulted in an over $500 million settlement to residents of Illinois who had their privacy rights violated by facial recognition. On March 31st, Washington State passed a landmark facial recognition bill. This piece of legislation generally requires a warrant before any public agency can run a facial recognition scan, unless there is an exception such as an emergency. Each piece of software must be tested for accuracy and unfair performance differences across skin tone, gender, age, and other characteristics. The bill also generally requires training and public recording around usage. This bill is heavily backed by Microsoft and we should expect to see more statewide legislations such as this in the near future. While no federal legislation exists on facial recognition, I am optimistic that further states will take increased action to protect their citizens from potential dangers of facial recognition, whether it be by the private sector or by the government. While I do feel that bans in certain cases are definitely applicable, I question their efficacy for a few reasons. The first is legislative carve-outs. While the city of San Francisco can ban facial recognition, it is not banned at the San Francisco airport, mainly because it's under the domain of FAA. Similarly, there are other government properties as well as areas that are under the federal jurisdiction that as much as the states do or the independent cities do, they're not able to block out those types of carve-outs. Secondly, I worry about the covert and unauthorized use of certain facial recognition technologies. One of the biggest stories of this year was Clearview AI, which was a company that had been scraping facial recognition data from a bunch of social media sites like Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and even sites like Venmo. And they were giving this technology to law enforcement agents. And when they had a data breach and a bunch of other additional companies were released to their clients at one point of clients, or at least demoed the software at one point, the issue was raised that several police organizations and law enforcement agencies said that they did not use it, but agents of their technology were agents were using, independent agents were using the technology. And how does this happen? Essentially, it did not receive approval at the agency level, but independent agents were using it. So I wonder, as long as facial recognition is legal somewhere in the US, are there pathways that other agents can use to gain access to this information and provide queries for it, even if it's not legal in their jurisdiction? So I also wonder if bans are also, are also as effective as we hope. In that situation, I would offer that we should have thorough regulation so in any instance of facial recognition appears, there's a set, strict set of guidelines that must be deployed when it's being used. The first is look out for vulnerable populations. This technology is already being deployed in schools, there are attempts to use it for identifying the homeless, as well as being deployed for elderly people who may get lost due to some type of dementia or Alzheimer's. The issues with this technology, while they may be coming from a good place, are of great number simply because facial recognition technology has the potential to misidentify and be inaccurate in very sensitive situations. As a result of this, I think it's important for all of us to advocate for those people who may not have a voice or may not even be aware of some of the complications that this technology arises. Secondly, we must all take a personal responsibility to stay updated on what's going on in our jurisdiction, in our area, and in our governments. If you ever hear facial recognition is being considered by your elected representatives, I think that we all have an obligation to do, take our civic duty and be more engaged in the process and ask questions about, has this been thoroughly trained? Like, what are the error rates given different groups? For more in-depth reads, I advise you to check out The Perpetual Lineup by Georgetown Law, which is a great paper that does a comprehensive study of where facial recognition is being used in this country, and even rates different deployments compared to each other. 
Shout out to Alvaro Bedoya and Claire Garvey at Georgetown Law. Second, Gender Shades by Joy Ballam-Winnie is a great paper that details some of the differences and accuracies we see for different demographic groups. Very vital piece. And for an even longer form read, I suggest reading part three of the National Institute of Standards and Technologies Facial Recognition Vendor Test, where they looked at a variety of different consumer facial recognition algorithms to determine whether they are accurate. There are also some great advocacy and information tools coming from Fight for the Future and the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Fight for the Future has an interactive banned facial recognition map that shows state and lo local efforts to rein in facial recognition technology. Additionally, they also have the Stop Facial Recognition on College Campuses scorecard, which rates different campuses based on their use of facial recognition, thus allowing for greater public awareness of facial recognition on college campuses. The Electronic Frontier Foundation has a Who Has Your Face tool, which is meant to reveal potential agencies that may have access to your face and biometric information due to known record keeping and sharing standards across the United States. In regards to my personal beliefs, I'll sum it up into three things. I believe that every state or Congress should adopt a law preventing the integration of facial recognition technology with police body cameras. To surmise my reasoning for this belief, it was well stated by the ACLU that police body cameras were started as a way to increase public transparency, not as another tool for surveillance by the police, and they should remain as such. Secondly, facial recognition should be added to the list of mandatory disclosures required in the use of criminal prosecutions so criminal defendants are known of the use of this technology in their case. Finally, I believe every law enforcement or administrative agency using facial recognition has a responsibility to tell their constituents of their jurisdiction that they are using and to what scope they are using facial recognition technology in their community. For more information, go to my website, canes.tech, or check out my long form podcast I recently did with Stanford Law School's Our Data Podcast. Big thank you to everybody that worked tirelessly to make Future Law 2020 happen such as Roland Vogel, Susan Salkin, Mike Genesareth, and Jamison Dempsey. I hope this video was informative. Please feel free to reach out if you have any more information and would love to collaborate in the future. Thank you and stay safe.